Good evening. My name is Jack Good. I'm past president of the Shores Vance in the court. And tonight we're thrilled to have as our speaker professional, Professor Ronald J. Reislack, who holds the chair of law and government at the University of Mississippi School of Law. He is a proud uh, graduate of Vanderbilt University School of Law from 1983. He was admitted to the Illinois Bar, Ron Clerk for the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals. He worked uh, for Jenner and Block in Chicago. He's been the secretary of the executive committee of the Southeastern Conference. He's also been the advisor to the Holy See's delegation to the United Nations. Uh, he is an author, co-author, or editor of at least 11 books. He has made many media appearances. And last but not least, and we want to hear about this, he is a member of the International Brotherhood of Magicians and holds the Order of Merlin Shield. With that, Ron. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, Order of Merlin Shield means essentially that you've been uh, in the club for 35 years. So. <laughs> I've been doing it for a long time. But uh, that is a lot of fun, and I do always carry a deck of cards with me wherever I go. So. <laughs> um, but that's not what I'm here to talk about today. Uh, by the way, uh, I've been a member of the uh, Inn of Court in Oxford for over 30 years. We are the William C. Cady Inn of Court, Inn of Court Three, the third oldest court in third oldest inn in the United States. So we're very proud of that, and I knew Judge Cady, uh, he's passed away now, but I met him when I was a young professor, and uh, I believe in the principles of this organization. I was the executive director for about three years, uh, some time ago, and so it's, uh, it's great to be here. Thank you for having me. Uh, today, you, you heard that I've, I've been a legal advisor to the Vatican's, or the Holy, we call it the Holy See, but the, the, the Holy See's delegation to the United Nations, and I thought I'd talk about that a little bit. First of all, why is the Holy See involved in uh, diplomacy? What is diplomacy? Primarily, how in the world did a guy like me get into a role like that? Uh, Robert Frost said, a diplomat always remembers your birthday but never remembers your age. It's kind of like that. Uh, we all engage, as, pretty as attorneys, we engage on diplomacy at one level or another all the time. Um, you know, I, if you've ever heard somebody, I've got a daughter who's a lawyer, people would say she's young. Susanna's going to be such a great lawyer. She argues, she's so good at arguing. Like that. That's not really the marker of a good lawyer. A good lawyer is a situation where you bring people together. And the best kind of result is a situation where everyone's happy, uh, where people come out the same. It's not a football game. I mean, nobody wants a tie in a football game. Oh, we would have taken, we played Alabama a couple weeks ago. But, <laughs> but you know, you don't want a tie. There are no ties in baseball, although I'm wearing my baseball tie, one of my baseball ties. Um, you, uh, whether it's a, a matter of international dis accord, disagreement, more conventional uh, domestic uh, dispute, the best outcomes are those where everyone feels like they're walking away with something. Uh, maybe that's what Winston Churchill meant when he said, diplomacy is the art of telling people to go to hell in such a way that they ask for uh, directions. Uh, of course, the threat of litigation often uh, that uh, underlies the negotiations, which we as lawyers take part in. A more serious threat, threat of war underlies a lot of times what's involved in negotiations at the United Nations, diplomatic work. Uh, diplomacy is about influencing national and international members to, to do different things. Will Rogers said the definition of diplomacy is saying nice doggy, nice doggy until you can find a stick. Um, and that's something that's often overlooked. Diplomats do have to get involved in realistic matters, sometimes get their hands dirty, sometimes uh, they are the only barrier between war and peace. Um, I've never been that barrier for you, don't worry about that, That's you know, I've never been in that kind of situation. But I have worked for the Holy See for a number of years uh, in their diplom diplomatic corps, and it's been a very interesting and rewarding thing. Let me first say the Holy See means the universal government of the Catholic Church. It's different from the Vatican City State, which is about 108 acres inside of Rome. Um, the Catholic Church has 1.1 billion adherents, about 17.5% of the world's population. 
Vatican or Vatican City is even much smaller. They uh, once asked Pope John, John the Twenty Third how many people work in the Vatican. He said about half of them. <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, uh, if you think about it, when the president speaks, uh, everyone in America, maybe everyone in the world, but certainly everyone in America is listening to him, and so he's speaking on behalf of America. When the Pope speaks, it's not just the people in Vatican City State. It's at least Catholics around the world, if not everybody else. The Holy See is the oldest continuing international organization in the world today. Its Secretary of State's office was established in 1486. It currently has diplomatic corps in 178 uh, nations around the world. The Holy See uh, seeks, of course, peace between nations, peace among peoples, uh, trying to avoid war, to provide justice for oppressed people, and tries to protect the independency of the Holy See and of religion in general. If you doubt the importance of the Holy See in terms of diplomacy, the largest single gathering of international diplomats in the world's history was at the funeral of uh, Pope St. John Paul II. Um, the uh, Holy See's diplomacy was severely tested during the 20th century. You can go back to World War I when Pope Benedict uh, XV sent the future Pope Pius XII to Germany to try to negotiate an end to World War I, and he went there with a peace plan. He didn't bring the war to an end immediately, but when the war came to an end a couple years later, it was very close to the plan that the Pope had put forward at that time. Uh, you then go into World War II, where the church is severely tested uh, throughout the time. And not only oppressed by the Germans and the Nazis, but in fact, suppressed by the Russians, the atheistic uh, nation that in fact suppressed churches throughout its, uh, its entire jurisdiction. There were terrible human rights abuses all around. The church itself, there, uh, there were about um, three million Catholics. If you take the generally uh, estimated numbers, there were about six million Jews that were killed in the uh, Holocaust. There were about three million Catholics that were killed in the Holocaust. Uh, churches were closed, properties were, were uh, seized. About 2,500 Catholic priests died at Dachau alone. Uh, priests, not just Catholics, priests. Not that long ago, I was asked to write a forward on a book, for a book, about uh, Catholic bishops during World War II. And so I read over what they did. It was amazing to me how often they engaged in diplomacy, negotiating with the Germans, providing food to people who were oppressed, Jewish or others, um, uh, trying to arrange for safe transport from one place or another. Uh, the certain members of the church in particular, in particular a guy who would become Pope John XXIII was known for providing uh, transport, sometimes false baptismal certificates to Jewish people so they could show they had been baptized and were no longer, at least in the eyes of church, were no longer Jewish. They were now Catholic and should, and sometimes they avoided prosecution, persecution, I say, persecution for that. Not always, sometimes the Germans uh, did not respect that. Pope Pius XII is, this is really, um, Ferris Stevens, a friend of mine, just uh, stepped down from the Attorney General's office here in Alabama, um, brought a copy of my book, uh, Hitler, the War and the Pope. That's the one I, I wrote about. He was the guy who was Pope during World War II. And fascinating, I mean, th 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 that book all started because I had a colleague who said, you know the Pope was a Nazi. I said, what? And I thought he was talking about who was the current pope, and that was John Paul II. No, no, I mean the guy's pope back then. I went from one thing to another to another, and ended up writing uh, this book. This is the second edition of it, actually. And I got an email last night, because the new archives will be opening in March, and discussion, early discussions, maybe about a third edition. Um, but this pope, he was one of the few people, certainly, According to the New York Times, uh, he was the only leader in occupied Europe who was speaking against the Nazis, speaking against Hitler. He was the one the resistance trusted. So when the German, like if you saw Val Valkyrie, the, the Tom Cruise movie, when the generals wanted to try to get people together into that plot to overthrow Hitler, they got a, a lawyer, Joseph Mueller, a lawyer from Berlin, who was also a pilot who had a history for business reasons of having been flying from Berlin to Rome in the past. 
So he became the conduit between the, uh, the rebellion, the folks who are plotting the overthrow, and the Pope. He met personally with the Pope and basically came back with messages that he could then show to other Germans who were trying to convince them to join in in this effort to overthrow Hitler and say, look, the Pope blessed this. The big question, frankly, and there's a wonderful book called Church of Spies. Uh, look, you may have read that. You're just, not, it's, it's a fascinating book, isn't it? Church of Spies by uh, Mark Ribling, who's a friend of mine. And, uh, and he, he explains that there were a lot of folks, these guys were going to kill Hitler. Now, the plot was to kill Hitler. And can you kill, can, can you be involved in a plot to murder somebody? And basically the Pope gave his blessing, in this case, to kill Hitler. Um, and Ribbling goes through the long theological exposition of that, which I'm not going to get into today. But essentially, if someone's doing this horrible stuff, if you've got to kill them to get them out of power, the Pope gave his blessing to that. So the, 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 the rebellion inside Germany was taking this around and getting people to join in with them in the effort to overthrow Hitler. Uh, Mueller, the, uh, the lawyer from Berlin, uh, from, from Munich, was uh, caught and uh, very nearly executed. He was beaten severely, uh, but he did live through the war and uh, ultimately, in fact, became a, uh, one of the uh, principal driving forces behind the United Nations later in life. So it's interesting how that kind of comes full circle, at least in terms of my story. Um, the Pope, by the way, did share some of the information that came from Germany. He shared troop movements in advance. Clear breach of neutrality. But he warned the Allies where German troops were coming. The Allies didn't know where to trust the information. I got this in my book. I didn't have everything about the Mueller in my book, but I got this in my book. Because the Pope wrote open letters afterwards when the Nazis came in. He said, you know, this is a horrible time. This will pass. We're not going to live through, through this situation. The Pope, when Rome ultimately was occupied, I always this, this is my my <coughs> demonstrative example. If you think of Vatican and St. Peter's Basilica here, and you've got the two arms coming out here, kind of that's how the and the piazza in here. The Pope's bedroom, his apartment is right here. I got to go up there a couple years ago. It's really cool, and I always envisioned because the Nazis there was a line drawn on the ground, a white line painted on the ground. There's a movie about this, Gregory Peck, uh, The Scarlet and Black. Uh, but on that side, it's Nazi soldiers with submachine guns. And on this side, it's the Swiss Guard with their pikes, you know, with the feathers and stuff. Um, and I always envisioned the Pope from here to out there. When I was up there, they said, no, the, the Germans were right behind his shoulder. They were right here. They were, they were really close. It wasn't as far away even as I envisioned in my mind. Uh, but the Pope remained defiant, and lots and lots and lots of Jewish people, and other victims too, survived the war either in the Vatican or in church properties. And a lot of Jewish people, that's maybe kind of easy, but think about this. Think about the AWOL German soldier who went up to, and this happened many times, went up to churches or other, other properties, knocked on the door and said, I'm, I'm, I'm leaving the Nazis, I want to be, and, and, and you're on the other side, do you open the door to let the Nazi in? For him, who could be a trap, right? But the stories are, the surviving stories, and who knows if some didn't survive, but a lot of AWOL German soldiers lived out the war inside of church property. There were downed American, uh, well, allied, I should say, airmen who were trapped behind enemy lines who survived uh, with the protection of the Vatican and, and the churches. Um, and uh, in fact, that's really what the Scarlet and the Black is primarily about, about uh, <coughs> Allied airmen who are trapped behind enemy lines. And there are all these people, and you're trying to coordinate everything, and you know, you're doing it without an army. You're doing it in the face of the most aggressive, out, you know, outrageous army in history, right at your doorstep. And yet, the church and the pope maintain the um, diplomatic relations and did what it could to help the victims. At one point in the war, Stalin actually uh, was critical of the Pope. And he said, uh, that he heard the Pope criticize him and Stalin says, how many divisions does the Pope have? And the story goes, when this was relayed back to the Pope, he 
he said, tell my brother Joseph he'll meet my divisions in heaven. Which I always think is like a really good thing. If the Pope thinks Stalin can make it to heaven, maybe I've got a chance to. You know? <laughs> it seems to me like a stretch. But, um, the, uh, when the Nazis occupied uh, Rome, one of the first things they did is they went to the Jewish community and said, we want 50 kilograms of gold in the next 36 hours, and if you pay that ransom, we won't deport Jews from Rome. It turns out that was just a way to get the gold from the Jews. They never really honored their deal. But the Jewish community, through the chief rabbi of Rome, Israel Zoli, came into the Vatican and asked for a loan of gold. The Pope said, as much as you need for as long as you need it. Uh, it turns out the Jewish community pretty much raised the gold on their own. I don't think they actually took the loan, although it was offered. Uh, Zoli ended up living out the occupation inside the Vatican. After the war, he actually converted and became a Catholic. He took Eugenio as his Christian name, which was the Pope's Christian name as well. Um, at the post-war trials at Nuremberg, German Foreign Minister Ribbentrop testified he had a whole desk full of diplomatic protests that were filed by the Holy See, many of them relating to unjust treatment of the Jews. Was the approach effective, the diplomatic approach? Well, uh, Israeli consul in Israel, Pinchas Lapid, spent six months studying the archives at Yad Vashem, Israel's Holocaust uh, authority on the, the, um, on the matter. He concluded that the Catholic Church saved more Jewish lives during the war than all of the churches, religious institutions, and rescue organizations put together. The chief rabbi of Denmark said if the Pope had been more kind of confrontational, less of a diplomat, Hitler would have probably massacred more than six million Jews and perhaps ten times ten million Catholics. One of my favorite stories about after the war is uh, there was this American uh, Under Secretary of State, Robert Murphy, who came to visit the Pope. Lots of people came to visit the Pope after the war, uh, including uh, one time uh, Pope Pius XII kept the future Pope, John XXIII, for waiting for about an hour because Clark Gable came to visit the Pope, and so the Pope was meeting his favorite movie star. But uh, when Murphy came and visited the Pope, uh, Murphy and the Pope had both been diplomats during uh, the 1920s in Germany as Hitler was rising. And Murphy says, Holy Father, uh, I guess uh, Neither of us were very good diplomats at the time. The Pope goes, what do you mean? He said, well, I told Washington, what I assume you told Rome is that this guy Hitler would never amount to anything. The Pope goes, you must remember, back then I was not infallible. <laughs> <laughs> um, during the Cold War, the Holy See and the Soviet Union had a very difficult time. Catholic leaders in the new areas of Soviet control were suppressed. Bishops and cardinals were given show trials. Here, I mean, here's what happened. So, World War II ends, and the Soviets claim a big chunk of Eastern and Central Europe that had not been under the control. These were heavily religious, heavily Christian and Catholic areas, and now they're part of the atheistic Soviet Union. When the Soviets first went in there, they told uh, everybody, uh, we're just like these religious leaders. They stood up against the Nazis, and we're standing up against the Nazis just like them. And then after about two years, once the Soviets were well in power, these leaders became real pains in the rear end for them. So they began framing them, having show trials, uh, prosecuting them and locking them away, and suppressing religion along the way. Cardinal Menzente wrote memoirs while he was in prison. He was from Hungary. There was Wyszynski in Poland. There was Stepanak in um, Croatia, Yugoslavia at the time, uh, there, and there were folks from other religions as well. Um, it was a very difficult relationship. Um, this ba Basically, that same principle is what grew into the allegations that uh, ended up calling Pope Pius XII, the guy I wrote about Hitler's pope. They kind of made the same argument about him. They didn't have to put on trial. They waited until after he died. And they wrote a fictional play. <clears throat> Despite this difficult situation, the Vatican continued to play a crucial role in assuring peace. In October 1962, an American spy plane was discovered 
Uh, American spy planes discovered Soviet missiles in Cuba, only minutes away from the United States. President John F. Kennedy insisted that they be removed. When Khrushchev ignored the ultimatum, uh, JFK set up a blockade. Millions watched the showdown on TV, Russian ships approaching Cuba, the U.S. blocking the ships. Behind the scenes, Vatican diplomacy went into play. On October 23rd, JFK sent a message to Rome. The next day, John XXIII sent a message to the Kremlin. It read in part, I beg heads of state not to remain insensitive to the cry of humanity. Peace, peace. Let them do all that is in their power to save peace. What he did was he gave Khrushchev a way to save face while backing down. And that's what happened. The uh, message from the Pope appeared in Pravda, the official communist newspaper, on October 26th under the headline, We Beg All Rulers Not to Be Deaf to the Cry of Humanity. Khrushchev was able to show that by withdrawing he was a man of peace. Two days later, Khrushchev, an atheist who was in the middle of a propaganda war with the Vatican, agreed to withdraw the missiles uh, and the Vatican diplomacy played a huge part. Ole Miss played at Mizzou over, we got beat again, uh, at Mizzou over the weekend and I got to travel with the staff over there. My wife and I flew on the plane, not with the team, but with the staff. And I'm reading this book, uh, Bishop Fulton Sheen, mentor and friend, because it's written by this guy uh, who is uh, Mon Monsignor Hilary Franco, who works at the Vatican, uh, it works at the Holy See at the United Nations. So I'm going to be up with there with him in two weeks, and I told him I'd read his book, so I had to get it done before I go back up there in two weeks. So I'm reading this book on the plane, and I learn a new story that I did not know about, and literally I discovered this Friday night and reread it on Saturday about Pope Paul VI. I knew Pope Paul VI came and spoke at the United Nations, but I didn't know this background. 20th anniversary of the United Nations, which was originally chartered in 1945, so 1965, was chartered soon after the end of World War II in San Francisco. Now, two decades later, the Cold War conflict between the United States and the USSR uh, dominates the proceedings, and the viability of the organization is in danger. From its lofty ideals and its potential, it has become an impotent organization with no funds. The United States Congress won't approve our nation's share of the United States finances because there are many who believe that the organization has no influence on the serious worldwide conflicts. It is you, uh, Thance, I hope that's how I pronounce his name, he was the, the uh, leader of the United Nations, you, Thance, fear that the United Nations will soon be totally, um, his fear will be totally defunct, become a meaningless footnote in history. So he asks Pope Paul VI to come to New York in the hope of promoting the United Nations. Pope Paul VI visit to New York marks the first visit of the Roman Pontiff to the United States. In Rome, they describe it as the Pontiff's first visit to the New World he says, I suppose it's just a difference of viewpoint. But the Pope addresses the General Assembly. Anyway, anyway the Pope comes, that's what the, and the points the point that the United Nations asked the Pope to come to give credence to the United Nations. And he came and it was a very influential, important talk he gave. Afterwards, he met with President Johnson, blessed <coughs> Johnson and his family. Um, and then, uh, then he did a huge mass in Yankee Stadium uh, that a lot, a lot of folks went to. And then he went back, this is when Vatican II, if you're a Catholic, Vatican II is a big deal, uh, was going on still. And he came back to the Catholics in Rome and said, hey, I just told everybody in the United Nations that we're going to work for peace. They need to work for peace. We need to work for peace. We need to make our church more involved in efforts towards peace than we have been. So <clears throat> it influenced both things within the United Nations and things back with the church. Uh, of course... Most of you would remember Pope John Paul II. Um, he used the power of his office to play a very significant role in bringing down the Soviet uh, Union. Um, with his trip to Poland in 1979, nine days that changed the world. <coughs> Pope never uttered a word that might directly lead to a confrontation between the church and state, between party and Christian believers. <clears throat> but through him, 
the church demanded respect for human rights <coughs> as well as Christian values. Poland's puppet leader literally trembled in the presence, the presence of the late pope. Not due to any fear of, of military action or anything like that, it was the moral authority <coughs> and the strength of truth. It was really Vatican diplomacy. My work with Holy See has been primarily been, uh, <coughs> like I said, at the United Nations. I work with them since the year 2000. <coughs> the pay is not great, but they say the rewards are out of this world. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, they have permanent observers. You've heard about, about a permanent observer to the United Nations. I'm about to be on my fifth permanent observer, so they're not as permanent as the job sounds like it might be. The United Nations is a man-made institution, so it's far from perfect. Uh, it's been uh, criticized in many circles many times along the way. The church has criticized the United Nations at various times. But I think it's important to recognize at the beginning of the 20th century, a bare majority of the world's population, about 50%, were Catholic, Protestant, Muslim, or Hindu. At the beginning of the 21st century, 64% of the world's people belong to one of those religious groups. And today, religious issues seem to be more central to the world peace and type of issues we deal with than ever before in any time in history. In 19, excuse me, in 2006, I went to Israel as part of a, a group studying anti-terrorism. And most people, when they go to Israel, it's like, you know, here's where the crucifixion was, here's where Jesus performed this miracle, here's the Last Supper. When I was over there, it's like, this is where the bomb went off, the sniper was up over there. It was a very different experience. Um, but what it showed me was that, you know, we have to deal with some religious type differences. And, and I was with a lot, of, a lot of professors who teach undergrads on terrorism type things. And they said, so many of our diplomats in the United States, number one, don't understand religion themselves. Number two, if they understand religion, they feel compelled not to talk about it because of our separation of church and state. I mean, can you imagine an American diplomat sitting down with an imam or an imam or or a priest or a minister and saying, you misunderstand your scripture. You got your scripture wrong. And we, we couldn't do that, right? Even if they believed that, even if it was pretty clearly the case, we can't kind of, as Americans, our government, they're, they're not gonna say, you know, you got this wrong, you gotta change your, your way you think about religion. But the Pope can. That's an important role that the church sometimes has played. The uh, most notable high-profile one probably was in 2006 at Regenburg, Regensburg University where Pope Benedict talked about the spread of Islam by the sword. Uh, and a lot of people said, well, he made a mistake. He didn't realize what political waters he was treading into. No, he completely knew what he was treading into. But he also knew he was maybe the only one who could tread in there and kind of say, hey, take a look at what's happening with your religion. Take a look at what good and bad things have come from what you've been doing for the last hundred years. Uh, I don't think an American diplomat could do that. You put issues on the table, issues that are still being debated and discussed today. You can't resolve everything. It's not just snapping your fingers and fixing stuff. But he's the only world leader really who could, in the context of inviting dialogue, put down a challenge like that. It's another reflection of why the Holy See is so important in peace negotiations, what it can do. United States, we have the Constitution, the Bill of Rights, the Declaration of Independence. They reflect shared values that we have. You know, what similar thing do we have in the world that we can point to? The Declaration of Rights of the United Nations, maybe? Um, I've been in situations at some of these um, meetings at the UN and other places where it's very clear we have different standards, different understandings. I was at a meeting in Rome with Iranian Ayatollahs at a time when the United States didn't have official contact with Iran. And it was my job, this was shortly after, you remember the cartoons, the, the Danish cartoons that led to riots and, and all kinds of stuff? It was my job to try to explain freedom of expression 